Sensible chat. Budgeting made easy. Really easy. Welcome to Sensible Chat with your host, Sensible Bobby, the show that is all about budgeting, smart spending, and saving. Today's episode is all about getting rid of financial stress. Sensible Bobby is going to share a few thoughts, then go straight to the Sensible University segment featuring Emily Guy Birkin, author of End Financial Stress Now, which happens to be one of Bobby's favorite personal finance books. And don't miss Saving Secrets for a new tip you can use today. Right now, here's Sensible Bobby. Thanks, Scott. I am so excited about our guest today because reading her book was life changing for me. I started budgeting because I was sick of being stressed about money. And after reading her book, I realized why it worked so well. Stress comes from fear. And a lot of my fear over the years has come from lack of planning. Well, budgeting is planning. And when you start to do it, you begin to think differently and begin strategizing. And that's what Emily's going to talk about. But first, I just wanted to share a few ways budgeting has relieved my stress. First of all, I always know if I have money or not. Now, I'm not just talking about looking at my bank account and seeing that there's money in there, but having money for specific things like going out to eat or buying clothes or fixing the car. I always know how much I have for any given purpose at a glance. Next, I have resources when unexpected expenses arise. And I can think creatively about how to pool my resources. Plus, whatever comes up, I've probably already thought it through and have a plan to tackle it. But most important, I'm confident that I can take on whatever comes my way. According to a survey by Price Waterhouse Coopers, money is the biggest source of stress, more than jobs, relationships, and health combined. I know how this feels. I used to feel sick to my stomach whenever I was asked, can we afford it? Whenever a bill came in, I stressed about how we would pay it. If we paid money for something fun, I couldn't enjoy it because I was stressed out about how we would pay for it. If my car made a weird noise, I'd freak out. You know what relieved my stress? Budgeting. I know, I'm a broken record, but tell me what you're stressed out about financially and I can tell you how budgeting can help. It really is that simple. But it's not just about the money. When you start budgeting, you're strategizing and that's what makes it work. You plan for what you need and become confident about planning for the future, even if you don't have all the money you think you need today. I challenge you to put a plan in place, follow it for a month, and not feel less stressed. Planning is what keeps financial stress at bay, at least in my experience. Now, for those of us who have spent much of our lives mired in financial stress, how do we end it? Ask Emily Guy Birkin. She literally wrote the book on it. Okay, budget heads, Sensible University is now in session. Today's guest professor is Emily Guy Birkin, money coach, blogger, retirement expert, and author of four books, including End Financial Stress Now, which happens to be one of Sensible Bobby's favorite personal finance books. You can find out more about her at emilyguyberkin.com. Emily, thanks for being our guest professor today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've got to tell you, your book is one of my favorite personal finance books, so I'm so excited to get a chance to talk to you in person about it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the book. There's just so much great information in here. I just want to jump right in because even just in the introduction of your book, you write, what if I told you that it was possible to stop worrying about money forever? And I found that such a freeing question. My first thought was, tell me more. I had to. <laughs> Just keep reading. But some people might think this cannot apply to me because of my income level, my mm -hmm. debt, whatever it might be. Do you think it's possible for anyone in any situation to stop worrying about money? I do. I think that at any income level, at any place, you can change your mindset in such a way that you replace worrying about your money, which is where you're feeling out of control, where you're constantly thinking something needs to happen for things to get better and change it to more of a strategizing about money, thinking, how will I solve these problems? Now, that said, there are people who are in pretty severe financial problems that are not of their own making. And in those cases, 
is there's always going to be the moments of, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But if you go from like, I need to get more money. I need someone to save me. I need money to save me. Like there's no way this will be fixed. Two, what are some things that I can do to make this a little better than it is right now? Not only does that allow you to kind of change the sense of worrying to a sense of, again, strategizing, thinking, like planning. It also is very freeing because it helps you think like, I don't have to wait for something to change. I can make the change and I can feel more in control of my situation, my money, my choices. And that is just unbelievably freeing. I totally agree. And I think that's so important because I remember feeling like such a victim about my money. And if you are coming from a victim standpoint, you feel like there's nothing that you can do. And like you said, you're waiting for someone else or something else to help you out. And if you can change that mindset, now you're in control. Absolutely. And remembering that no matter what happens, you are going to be the one dealing with it, not your money. That's really an important thing to think about. We have this tendency to think, well, if I had more money, I could do this. Well, no, you know, money is just the tool. You can do what needs to be done. And one thing I I like to remind people is if you think about the hardest thing you've ever had to do, whether that's living through the death of a parent, giving birth, having to work two jobs to make ends meet, even, I mean, anything that you have had to do, if you asked yourself before it happened, will you be able to do this? you would have said, no, no, there's no way. But you find the resources. The thing with worrying about money is that you have this constant sense of, I can't do this. But if you just remember, no, I have the resources. I can draw on those resources and I can handle what life throws at me. It's not going to be easy, but I'm that good. (laughs) And that's what I want people to remind themselves. You lived through something that was incredibly difficult and you can find a way to get yourself to a place where you don't feel so controlled by how money ebbs and flows in your life. You can feel much more in control of what you do in reaction to the money ebbing and flowing in your life and recognizing it's a tool rather than something that is controlling you. Definitely. And I think that's probably what you're talking about in the book when you say, you know, I'm not promising an end to all financial problems, but rather an end to the stress associated with them, which I think is a very important difference. So let's just talk a little bit more about what the difference is between that. So there's never going to be a time where there's no financial problems. That's just not possible. And frankly, even Warren Buffett has tough conundrums when it comes to money. I'd love to have his financial problems, but he does have them. And so the thing to remember is that you are going to encounter financial problems, remembering that they don't need to be something that frighten you is the important thing. You know, it's not a boogeyman. It's just something that you need to figure out what resources you're going to use to solve them. And then again, changing that mindset where you go from like, okay, yeah, financial problems are a fact of life and I can deal with them allows you to let go of worries about future financial problems. That's something my husband tends to be a worrier about future financial problems and, you know, helping him to recognize like, worrying about how we'll deal with it when we get to it. First of all, we don't know if it's going to happen. And secondly, like we have the resources we need when we get there. And then you can also stop agonizing about past decisions. Like they are done. You did the best you could with the resources you had at the time. And you can kind of let go of that, you know, recognize like you dealt with these problems in the past. If you encounter a similar one in the future, you might do something different. And then also you can recognize that you won't, you don't need to feel paralyzed by current problems because Because again, you have the resources. You are that good. It's just a matter of taking the time to think strategically and kind of allow yourself to separate your feelings about the problem from the way you deal with it. And that will help you, first of all, feel much more confident about what you're doing and also will give you a lot more ability to make the best financial decision with the resources you have. So let's talk about some of these and we'll start with some that are a little less daunting maybe and a little less, a little more just things that come into play that you can do differently. Let's start out with opportunity cost and specifically you have a section in the book titled why it may cost you more when it's free, which I kind of found as a, I mean, everybody thinks it's free, it's free, but Mm -hmm. that's not really true, right? 
That's absolutely correct. Yes. So opportunity cost is whatever you lose out on by making any particular decision. So I remember my first big lesson in opportunity cost was after I graduated from college, I ended up moving to Columbus, Ohio, because I followed a guy, which was not the best decision I've ever made. And uh, at the time, I had these grand dreams of moving to New York and taking the publishing world by storm. When I broke up with the guy, I remember talking to my sister saying, I feel like I've limited myself by moving to Columbus. And my sister, who is so wise, said to me, any choice you make means you are limiting yourself because that means the other choices aren't there. So if I had moved to New York, I wouldn't have met my husband. So that would have been limiting myself. So that's how that was really important wake up call when I was 22 or 23 years old about what opportunity cost is and recognizing that any choice you make means that you are limiting the other choices you can make. So when it comes to things that are free, The problem is that we just stop recognizing that there's an opportunity cost because since there's no financial cost, we feel like there's no cost whatsoever. But there's still a downside to anything that we accept that's free. So like kind of a a little one is for me, I really want to have a decluttered house. And yet when I go to conferences or there's a free gift with purchase, I'm like, ooh, free mug. (laughs) You know, like, (laughs) yay, I need another water bottle. And forgetting that the cost is my clean house. And so that's something that we have a tendency to just kind of like completely elide over like the question of where am I going to put this new thing? You know, there's no room in my cabinet for another water bottle or another mug. So where, where is it going to go? What am I going to have to give up to keep this mug? And I might I end up having to just give it to goodwill, in which case I've wasted some time by carrying it all the way home and then giving it away. <laughs> and so that's the thing where we have this tendency when something is free, we just lose our ability to recognize the opportunity cost of accepting the free item. And that can be very expensive depending on what the free item is. So how do we go about combating that mindset of free is free? There's a couple of things that are really helpful. One I got from a friend of mine who is a master crafter and she homeschools her children and she doesn't accept anything for free because people are are always giving her things for crafting or for really reduced price unless she'd be willing to spend full price on it. So if you're looking at the free gift with purchase or you are at, you know, annual conference and there's all kinds of swag, if you look at that t-shirt or that mug and go like, would I pay $20 for this? And your answer is no, then it needs to stay where it is. Yeah. (laughs) So that's a really important thing because it helps you remember that what you're looking at does have a cost. And if you can think more rationally about that cost, if you think, would I spend full price on this item? Another easy way to do it without going all the way to full price is, would I spend 50 cents on this item? (laughs) 50 cents is next to nothing. Like everybody's probably got 50 cents somewhere in their pocket or with the lint in their bottom of their purse. Would it be worth it to you to find that 50 cents to take this free item? And if you go, no, (laughs) then you obviously don't need it. Putting some sort of financial stake into it can help you to recognize the cost of what you are possibly getting for free. Sure. And that really helps to get in the value mindset too, because how much are you valuing this item? And, you know, we all have so much stuff and then you get into at some point, do you need a storage shed for this stuff? So now Mm -hmm. you're paying money just for junk that you may not actually ever use. Yes, exactly. And those are the things that we don't think of storage. We don't think of time. We don't think of cleaning (laughs) um, and and all of those things because free is just so exciting to our brains. Sure. Now, on the other side of that is scarcity. And it was really amazing to me to read about scarcity in your book and how it can affect your decisions. I've always seen this as the poor mindset, but I think we're talking about the same thing. So explain what scarcity means from your perspective. Scarcity in general just means that you have more needs than resources to meet them. And that's something that happens to all of us at some point or another. So in the book I talk about, I actually had sleep scarcity when my eldest was a baby. The child did not sleep for 18 months. And so the problem was more than just that I didn't have enough hours 
for the rest that I needed, because that is something that could be relatively easily fixed. The problem is that I also got into a scarcity mindset, which was where when you are lacking something, your brain focuses on it. There are two researchers called Sundell um, Melanathan and Eldar Shafir, uh, who wrote the book called Scarcity. They call that tunneling. And we've all experienced tunneling. You know, if you have an essay due for school and you're not able to work on it until the night before it's due, that actually is tunneling working well for you. You're able to focus because all of a sudden this just got real. I have to get it done. Right. <laughs> the problem with scarcity tunneling is that you are consistently in this mindset. And so you are always thinking only about what it is that you're lacking. So people who have been without financially or people who have been without food, people who have been without sleep can recognize this where you spend an unreasonable amount of time daydreaming about winning the lottery or you know having these uh, fantasies about going to the Ritz and having a, a huge huge meal. For me, when I was suffering from sleep scarcity, I would like have these long involved ideas about what hotel I would go to and what the pillows would look like (laughs) (laughs) so that I could finally get some sleep. And so with that tunneling, because you're so focused, you are not able to do the things that would actually help you. Again, with my sleeping, sleep training with my child would have helped, but I was so exhausted, I couldn't even imagine doing it. It was going to take resources that I felt like I didn't have. And then I also wasn't doing the little things that would help me feel a little better, like changing to pajamas every night. I would often fall asleep on the floor next to my son's crib, or I'd just go to sleep in my clothes. My rest was less restful. And so I just kept going in that tunneling. Similar things happen with people when they are in a financial scarcity mindset. They're so focused on the next paycheck or the next payday loan or the next way that they can get some money. They forget about bills coming on the horizon after that. So it's constantly putting out little fires without stopping and taking a look at the whole picture to figure out what you can do to end the little fires coming up over and over again. And that's so stressful if you're just constantly putting out fires, but like you said, never planning for not letting the next one start. I mean, man, in your body, in your soul, in your mind and everything, it's just a constant state of terror almost. Yes, absolutely. And the tunneling is, you know, when you know it's happening, you can find ways to get some help. In addition to the tunneling, Melanathan and uh, Shafir also found that people have something called the bandwidth tax. So bandwidth is your ability to focus on something, you know, your ability to think through things. And if you are experiencing a scarcity mindset, because you're so focused, you're so tunneled on the one thing that you're lacking, it actually saps your ability to think about other things. They actually did an experiment where they asked people, first they asked for their income, then they asked them to think about if they had a car repair they needed to take care of. And for some, they said $150 car repair. And for some, they said $1,500 car repair. And then after that, they gave a short IQ test. And they found that wealthier respondents did great on the IQ test, whether it was $150 car repair or $1,500 car repair. Less wealthy respondents, people People who would really struggle to pay for those car repairs did fine after $150 one, but they lost 13 to 14 IQ points after the $1,500 car repair question. And that's because their brain was taxed with the question of money, even though it was a hypothetical. And 13 to 14 IQ points is the difference between how you would do after a great night's sleep and how you would do after staying up all night. So if you imagine the, the fogginess that you feel after staying up all night, that is is what scarcity does to your brain. That's amazing. And it just goes to show how much just changing how you think about things can really change your life. Yes, the clarity that you can take on once you have managed to lift the fog of scarcity can be just enormous. So let's talk about some ways that we can combat scarcity. And one of the things that you talk about in the book is building slack into your budget, which I love because this is so important to a successful budget. So explain what you mean by building slack into your budget and how that can help. So a lot of times with budgeting, particularly if you don't have much money, you budget every single penny that comes in, if you are budgeting at all. And so what that means is if there's an emergency, you assume that everything will go perfectly at all times. And that is just not the way the world works. 
So that means that any emergency will have like echo effects in every aspect of your finances. So if, for instance, your car breaks down and you need to get that fixed so you can get to work and you're counting on your paycheck, but you have to use your rent money to pay to get your car fixed, you know, it just keeps cascading because then where are you going to get your rent money? Well, if you're going to take that from your utility money, then where are you going to get your utility money? Right. And it's the house the jack built. Yeah, vicious cycle. <laughs> yes. So one of the reasons why like the personal finance expert greatest hits starts with build an emergency fund. You need to have some slack in your budget. You need to assume that something bad will happen. Now, the problem is if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you think, well, I can't build slack in my budget. Every single penny is accounted for. So there's a couple of things that people can do to build slack in their budget. The first thing that I recommend is start by opening a savings account and automatically transferring something small, like $10 a week into that savings account. Now, that small amount of money is for two reasons. First, you're unlikely to miss it. You know, there are very few people who can't afford to transfer $10 or even $5 a week into a savings account. Other reason is an amount that small, less tempted to borrow from it because it's so little. So that's something you can just be having in the background. Then the other thing that you can do, of course, like $10 a week is only $520 a year, which is not much slack. So then you can schedule an automatic increase to say $20 or $25 a week in two months or three months, because at that point you will have gotten used to having $10 less and you may be able to, again, reduce the amount that you are bringing home every week. So those are two things that are easy for pretty much anyone. Now, granted, there are people who are really struggling and I I recognize that that might not be possible, but you can use the same idea. You know, a change jar is a great way to try to build some slack into your budget if you're really struggling. So those are things to get you started. So even if you're living paycheck to paycheck, you can find a way to build a little slack. The other thing that I recommend is think through if you'll excuse the phrasing, the stuff really hits the fan, right. you know, if something really terrible happens. What would you do that you don't want to do? And I'm talking about stuff like talk to your mother-in-law who is so snippy, but who has money and would lend it to you. It just, yeah. you'd never hear the end of it at Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, sell the pinball machine that you bought, you know, as a newly married couple and you absolutely love. And it's something that really matters to you. Like think through what is the thing that you would do if you absolutely had to get some money and recognize what that is, recognize the cost that it will be to you, but know that that is there before the stuff has hit the fan. <laughs> yeah, that can be such a calming thing just to have that mm-hmm. in your head because, you know, when stuff does hit the fan, you are mm-hmm. just not in the mind frame to be able to think any of that stuff through. You know, for mm-hmm. me, when I get in those situations, I panic and my brain just goes completely blank. So mm-hmm. it's much better for me to think about those things ahead of time. So you kind of have them in your arsenal and they'll kind of automatically come to you because you've already thought them through. And it's also, it's helpful if you have someone whom you trust, you can talk to about it, who, if you're having trouble, they, they can remind you. I had a situation like this recently where as a freelancer, you know, sometimes money ebbs and flows a little bit in my life. And I was also waiting on a settlement check from something to do with my father's estate. And it took a month and a half for the check to come through. And then I was having a low, low month. And I was saying to my sister, like, because she was also getting a settlement check, I was saying like, this really has to come in or else I'm going to have to do X that I really don't want to do. And Tracy, my sister said to me, do X. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, you're right. I would be so much less stressed if I just did that. And what X was for me was dipping into an account that I have that was earning some interest that I liked and I didn't want to cut into that. And I didn't want to deal with the costs of getting into that account. But having her tell me, just do it. You'll feel better. You'll feel much more calm and collected about what's going on. And so that's the the other important thing. Even some, I wrote the book on ending financial stress and still I sometimes need someone to say, hey, do what you tell other people to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sometimes just, you know, getting rid of that stress is worth mm-hmm. the couple of dollars you might lose in interest, you know. Exactly. And that's one of those things where like, even if you are generally on top of things, you can miss something that that is completely out obvious to someone outside of you, which is why I suggest like, if you have someone you can trust to talk about this, even if it's just your spouse, so you can bounce off of each other, that can really help you to recognize when you are 
kind of winding yourself up into a story that's not true. You know, that my story was, I can't take out of my Vanguard account. That was my story. But that wasn't true. I could. It was always an option. And that brings up an interesting point because I've had this experience in helping other people with their budgets. The whole reason of having somebody help you with a budget is not because you can't do it yourself. I mean, when it comes right down to it, it's just math, right? Any of us Mm -hmm. can do simple math. But sometimes you get so caught up in the emotion of doing it, you just can't see straight. And like you said, you need somebody else to point out what is obvious if you're not stressing about it or what are ideas that are right there. But sometimes you just can't see them and somebody else looking over and giving you those ideas can just be a godsend. Absolutely. It's one of the reasons why I would love for the taboo about talking about money to just go away. I think we would all be a lot financially healthier if we could talk about money for that very reason, because a lot of times, you know, we get so stuck in our own heads that we forget there are options out there. And we also beat ourselves up for something that we would be so kind to a friend about that our friend would be like, it's okay. You know, we all go through tough times and there's no need for you to beat yourself up about it. That brings up something that you discuss in the book, different barriers. And one of them is being embarrassed for not understanding personal finance. And I feel like, you know, if we could just change what some people view as shame about what they don't know into curiosity, Mm -hmm. then so much stress and heartache could be avoided because we would just be willing to ask those questions and learn more about these things that are pretty simple. We just don't always know. Yes, there is so much shame associated with money. And then there's so much shame associated with not knowing something. So put those together and you've got a real volatile combination. And so people often feel very ashamed about not knowing something to the point where they'll feel ashamed in wanting to educate themselves. Like, well, I should know this. I'm an adult. I should know this. You know, I'm making good money. I should know this. I've been taking care of my kids all this time. And that is, you know, very counterproductive thinking. That feeling of embarrassment is entirely in your head. Now, I I really love the Harry Potter quote where it's like, you know, of course it's happening in your head, but why does that mean it's not real? (laughs) Um, So just because your embarrassment is happening entirely in your head doesn't mean that it's not real. But it's something where you can say to that inner voice that's saying like, well, you should do this or you should know this. You can say, I don't. So what? You know, and recognize like it's okay to be where you are. Yeah. Everyone started at the beginning somewhere, just the same way like little children do not feel embarrassed when they can't walk. Right. You know, as they're learning to walk, they don't feel any embarrassment. They just keep trying. It's the same way with learning anything and especially money. There's no need to feel embarrassed about it. Just go ahead and keep trying and reach out to people. And yes, there are going to be people out there who are going to be difficult to talk to, but most people are going to be very open and happy to chat with you about how how money works for them or things like that. It's a lot less fraught conversation than you think it is if you are willing to broach it. So just recognizing that the embarrassment is not something that you need to feel and regarding yourself with both compassion and curiosity and regarding the subject with both compassion and curiosity can lead you to a lot of wonderful insights. Definitely. Such an important thing. And none of us ever have all the answers. So it can just be as simple as, you know, what do you think about this? Let me pick your brain and see if you have any ideas that I haven't thought of, because none of us can absorb every single thing 100 percent that's out exactly. there. Exactly. So. You have an article titled Five Mental Biases That Are Keeping You Poor, and you actually cover this in chapter five of your book. Now, we could talk about this for hours, but which ones do you see as the most detrimental of these biases and how can we combat those? One of the worst biases, and it happens to all of us, is something called hedonic adaptation. And what that means is that we get used to things very quickly. So, you know, you buy a new car and the day you drive it off the lot is exhilarating. Within a couple of weeks, I mean, before the new car smell has completely dissipated, your new car is old hats, you know, it's just your car. And so the problem is that because it feels so good to buy that new car or buy that new gadget, we will often keep chasing that feeling, even though no one thing is going to remain that happy making sensation that you you had when you first bought it. Now, the flip side of that is hedonic adaptation also means that we get used to negative things quickly too. There was this incredible 
whole study back in 1978 that looked at recent lottery winners and people who had recently become paraplegic because of, of an accident and measured their levels of happiness. And immediately after, obviously the lottery winners were a lot happier than the people who had become paraplegic. But if you went two months in the future, only two months, both of them had returned to their original levels of happiness as they got used to their new normal. So that's one of those things that is really good to remember, recognizing that if you have a change in fortunes, whether good or bad, you will get used to it. And so that can be real problematic if you don't recognize that that's what you're doing is that you're chasing after the feeling. Like we talk about retail therapy because it does feel good to buy new things. But if you don't recognize that you're chasing the hedonic adaptation, you could really get yourself into a major spending problem. Yeah, that's for sure. And just once again, it comes back to seeing money as a tool rather than something that you're always chasing that's going to make you happy. I mean, because the money itself isn't going to make you happy. It's whatever you do with it. But that's based on really what's going to make you happy is fulfilling your dreams, your values and all those kind of things. So it's using the money as a tool instead of chasing the money. Exactly. So there are two things that can help you combat that hedonic adaptation. One is expressing gratitude. Regularly expressing gratitude can really help you keep in mind how full your life is. And that's something I've actually, I've been doing for many years now with my sons. Part of our bedtime routine is we say our gratefuls. So I'll say, what are you grateful for today? And so sometimes I get hilarious answers. (laughs) Like uh, I remember my younger son said, whales and fire trucks. (laughs) But, you know, having that moment to recognize, like, I have a very full life can really help combat that urge to buy something new to help you feel better. The other thing is recognizing the way that you spend money can provide you with more satisfaction. Research has shown that if you spend money on small, regular experiences, you will get much more satisfaction out of that spending than you do by buying things or a large experience. So committing to going to happy hour with your best friend every Wednesday night is going to make you a lot happier than going on a week-long vacation with your best friend. Because after two days on the week-long vacation, you've gotten used to being at the beach. Whereas every Wednesday, you get to look forward to uh, you know having margaritas and dishing with your best friend. Yeah. <laughs> You know, things like these kind of things that you're talking about is what I thought was so great about your book, because we're talking about ways here, mindsets that can change your outlook on money, but change the way that you use your money at any income level. And it doesn't have anything to do with smart spending, smart saving, whatever, which all of those are important. But these are just mindsets that if you can think this way, they're just going to change your life so much without ever changing a dime that's in your pocket. Exactly. Yeah. This is why I really do believe that at any income, you can end financial stress because changing the way that you look at the money that you have can make you feel much more grateful and satisfied with what you have, even if you want to have more. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to earn more, wanting to get to a different place or realizing, you know what, I have this really high powered job that earns me a lot of money, but I'm not happy doing it. And I'd be happier taking a major pay cut and doing something that is more meaningful. And, you know, it's all about living the life you want to live. And that's what money should be for. It should be a tool to help you live the life that you want. It should not be something that you're just constantly trying to achieve without thinking about why. It should not be a cudgel that you use to beat yourself with or other people with. It should simply be a tool to help you have the best time you can have on your go around on this rock. This is something that I I think we all struggle with regardless of our income level or our money status. And it's really hard because it involves dealing with family and friends. Financial enabling and dependency, there's so much of this that goes on and there's so many emotions wrapped up into it. Can you talk a little bit about what financial enabling and dependency is, first of all? Sure. So financial enabling is when you are taking care of things financially for someone who can do that for him or herself. So, you know, financial enabling is not paying for your kids <laughs> to do stuff. It's paying, for instance, a woman whose adult son wrecks his car because he was driving drunk. If she buys him a new car, that could be financial enabling. And so dependency, financial dependency is when you are relying on outside sources to live, to make your financial obligations. 
And this is a real problem in part because a lot of people see money as an extension of love. And so the mother buying the car for her son might say, well, like, I want him to have a good life. I want him to get back on track. And so because I love him, I'm going to buy him a new car. But that's really difficult because he might need to feel the consequences of his actions and take responsibility for, you know, having smashed up his car, for having made that terrible decision to drive while intoxicated. And so that's where financial enabling gets to be very problematic. And parents often, I mean, it happens with all kinds of relationships, but you often see it with parents with their adult children and also people in the sandwich generation who have aging parents. You know, you are allowing the fact that they've made not great financial choices become your problem. And so that not only constricts your own ability to make great financial choices for yourself, but it also just keeps this process going where they are never in a position to take responsibility for their own financial choices. What do we do about this? Because there's so much guilt for the person that this is kind of put upon, whether it's the parent of the adult child or the child of the aging parent. And, you know, depending on your income level, it could be a huge financial burden. But even if it's not, it could be a huge emotional burden because Mm -hmm. you're having to change these decisions. Maybe you made good decisions so that that didn't happen to you. And now you're having to take responsibility for somebody else who did not or, you know, Maybe you don't have the money, but either way, you don't feel like you can say no because this is your family. But for your own survival or your own psyche, sometimes even you have to find a way to say no. So how do we deal with that in the best possible way? This is one of the the stickiest issues when it comes to money. And part of the problem is that people often don't think about it globally. This is a tunneling issue. They think about it each time, you know, that your shifty cousin comes and asks for a loan. Each time your aging parents say like, we don't know how we're going to pay for dad's medication, you know, something like that. And so you think about it each time. And again, it's little fires you keep putting out. So what people need to do is really think globally and think through like, what can I afford to provide help-wise for my parents, for my adult child? What can I afford to do? And really make it like a line item in your budget. And then set that boundary and make it clear and say, you know, it might be, mom, dad, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to keep helping you with this. I'm sure that you can do X, Y, or Z instead. Or, you know, I can help you with this non-monetary way, but I cannot help you financially. So you might simply cut it off. Or you might say, this is all I can afford to do. Please don't ask again. Those are such difficult conversations. And anyone who knows how to have those conversations without feeling overwhelmed should bottle it and sell it for a million (laughs) dollars. (laughs) But that really is what it's about is to think globally about like what it is that you're doing so that it's not you're not lurching from problem to problem where you end up enabling a family member and really think through what you are able to do. And, you know, if there are ways that you can help that are non-financial, always offer that because that's a way that you can make it clear. I do care about you. You are my family and I love you, but I can't do this money question you're asking of me. I had this situation with somebody close to me several years ago and the way that I went about it because I didn't, you know, have anything to give them monetarily. So what I did was spend time kind of researching in their area what things were available to them as resources for somebody in a dire position. And that way I at least felt like I could give them some resources somewhere to turn, even though I couldn't help directly. And that can be priceless. You know, a lot of times the real help needed is something that is non-financial that, you know, you may have the bandwidth to do for someone who's dealing with a difficult problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, too, because, you know, if they're in that stage where they're panicking, they just can't think about those things. I hadn't even thought about the fact that that might not have occurred to them because they're just panicking and this is the first thing they could think to do and that's all they can think of. Now, part four of your book, we've talked a lot about, you know, these issues and somewhat, you know, how to combat them. But part four of your book is achieving a stress-free financial life. And there are so many great ideas in that. But give me a few that people can take away right now to make their financial lives a bit less stressful, especially those who are struggling just to make ends meet. 
So one of the things that I like to recommend, and people are always very surprised by this, is one thing that people can do is adjust their withholding. If you regularly get a large refund in April from a tax refund, then you can adjust your withholding so that you get to take home that money each month. And so like, what difference would that make if you had an extra $200 each month in your budget? For a lot of people, that's a huge change. That makes a major difference. Now, of course, the caveat is that means you won't have the big refund check. And a lot of people use that refund check for a lot of different things. I mean, they they may end up investing it. They may end up going on vacation. They may end up buying something big with it. And that is a common habit. If people tend to blow their tax refund because it's a lot of fun to get $3,000 all at once... (laughs) I you know, can't blame you for that. It is fun, especially if you are deprived most of the year. However, is that feeling of being able to like, I've got a big check and I can spend it worth 12 months of stress? The other thing people worry about with that is they worry that it's illegal. And that is not true at all. You have the right to adjust your withholding at any time. You just need to get another W-4 form from your employer. And you can go onto the IRS website to calculate the proper number of exemptions you can take for your withholding. And then generally, if you turn it into your HR department within the next paycheck, that will change how much money you're getting each month. It's a really nice easy, painless way to improve your financial situation. And one other thing that I would like to say, there are some folks who simply know that they are not going to be responsible with an extra $200 a month, but they can be responsible with a big refund check. If that describes you, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you simply are like, I don't know how to make ends meet, this could be a way to do that. What I like is that it requires next to no effort. It's easy and it's I'm not going to say instant, but it's pretty immediate depending on your HR department. And even if they don't think about it during the year, because that's such a fantastic idea, that is a way definitely to get money right now. But if you've come to the tax season and you're getting that big refund check, if you've been stressing all year, you might also take a step back and just think, okay, instead of going out and having fun with this, which would be so great to do because I've spent so much time stressing, but I can stop the stress from next year just by using this in Mm -hmm. my budget to kind of save for all those Mm -hmm. things, you know, that have been hitting me every month that I can't deal Mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Putting that big refund check aside in an emergency fund means that you have immediately built slack into your budget without changing anything else. And that's something that, you know, it can be so hard to think of. We tend to think of tax money as free money, you know, like, woohoo, I got free money. (laughs) Whereas we don't think of our paychecks that way. We think of it as like, well, this goes to bills and pays for what I need to live. But the thing is your tax refund is your paycheck. Remember, that is your paycheck. (laughs) It took a walk to D.C. and came back again. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like they say, you know, if you set something free and it comes back to you, it was yours to begin with. So, hey, (laughs) that's perfect. (laughs) Now you know for sure it's yours. So so use it wisely. So you've already talked about this a little bit, but just tell me why you believe that budgeting is such an important part of living a stress-free financial life. So one of the things about money is a lot of people, they want to not think about money. And that is just not going to be possible for stress-free. You know, people think, well, if I'm not thinking about it, I'm not stressing about it. And that's not true because if you're not thinking about it, you're not strategizing, you're not planning ahead. And again, you're letting money make the decisions because you are not making them yourself. This sounds a little woo-woo, but you're in a relationship with your money. And your money will take care of you if you take care of it. And in the same way that you would be resentful or your spouse would be resentful if every time you came in the room, they're like, oh, I can't deal with you right now. Or, oh, you, I got to think about you. (laughs) Nothing good will come of that in a relationship with people. And so you can't expect anything good to come of your relationship with money if you have that reaction to your money. And so budgeting is really all about maintaining your relationship with money. Budget tends to be a bad word for a lot of people. Like they think budgets are spreadsheets and deprivation. (laughs) That's really not what it is. A budget is really all about figuring out what you want and how to get there. So, you know, sometimes people will say spending plan because that's a little more palatable, but it's really about goal setting with money. And so if you think about it that way, and I really prefer to start the budgeting journey with thinking through what do you want? Like, what is your 
big dream that you whisper to yourself at night that you tell no one about? (laughs) Yeah. What is it? And so like, you know, maybe it's, you know, going to Machu Picchu. Maybe it's going back to school and getting a PhD. And so if you start with that as the basis of your budget, like this is this big thing that I want, how can I get there? What little thing can I do today to get me closer to this big dream? That is really where a budget is like this wonderful foundational life affirming process rather than spreadsheets and deprivation. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if you can see it that way, then it can even make it exciting to a point to pay off your debt because once you pay off the debt, now you can take the next step in getting towards what you really want. Absolutely. Yeah, it can actually be a lot of fun to like receive your bills. (laughs) Yeah, I know it was for me. (laughs) But it can be fun to be paying off your debt, to receive your bills and realize like you have more money left over because of the way that you've been doing things. So like you can pay your bills and you still have some money left over to be able to put into savings or you've already put it into savings and you have enough to pay off your bills and all of those things. It becomes something that you feel competent about. And anytime you feel competent in something, you tend to enjoy doing it. That's very true. And I know for me, budgeting was just so freeing. And that's why I loved your book so much, because that's why I started doing it simply to relieve the stress in my life. And once I had everything in front of me and it was planned, I didn't have to stress anymore about every bill that came in or every little thing that could happen. You know, all these things on my mind could just go away. And it was all in the plan and it was very simple to carry out. That's wonderful. Emily, I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us today and such great information. And this book, I think every person should be required to read this book. I just think it has so much great information. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise and your thoughts with us today. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Our guest professor today has been Emily Guy Birkin, author of End Financial Stress Now. Visit her website at emilyguyberkin.com to learn more about her and get the book. What else can you say? Emily is full of great ideas, and so is her book. I highly recommend it. The only thing you're going to lose is financial stress. If you value the green, if you save as you go, the wealth is closer than it seems, and you can make that cash flow. Welcome to Saving Secrets, where we share super easy and ready-to-use savings tips you may not have heard before. If you've got saving secrets you'd like to share, email me, bobby at sensiblechat.com. That's B-O-B-B-I at sensiblechat.com. And I'll share your tip in an upcoming episode. Today's saving secret is... Give yourself a rent increase. Yes, you heard me correctly. I want you to raise the rent. This is a great way to save and prepare you for what may come. See, if you really did get a rent increase, what would you do? Move? Probably not. You'd probably find a way to come up with the extra money to stay in your home, right? So find a way to come up with that money and save it. Plus, if you really do get a rent increase, it won't be quite the punch in the gut it may have been if you weren't prepared for it. When it does come, you'll already be used to not spending that money. That's my saving secret. What's yours? If you've got a saving secret to share, email me, bobby at sensiblechat.com. Next month's episodes are going to be all about cars, because for most of us, that's our biggest expense or purchase next to our homes. So we're going to talk with a car buying expert about how not to get taken for a ride. And we're going to talk to an insurance expert about how to protect yourself and your car without breaking the bank. Thanks for listening, and remember to leave a rating and review for this podcast. I'd love to know what you think. Until next time, keep spending and saving the sensible way. That wraps up another episode of Sensible Chat with your host, Sensible Bobby. If you need help with your budget or want to share your thoughts, reach out to her through the contact page at sensiblechat.com. While you're there, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. 